This is part four of my series on building and testing a pulse tube cooler in an attempt to reach minus 196 C to liquefy nitrogen. In this video, I'll be testing a design that uses two valves instead of a reciprocating piston. This configuration is known as a Gifford McMahon type pulse tube, or GM for short. It uses a rotary valve that alternates between connecting the pulse tube to the high pressure and low pressure sides of a compressor. In my case, I'll be using a pair of solenoid valves to accomplish the same function. GM type cryocoolers, whether pulse tubes or mechanical displacer types, are inherently less efficient than coolers that generate their pressure oscillations from direct coupling to a move-in piston. This is for two reasons. One, because of unavoidable losses through the valve, and two, because work from compression isn't being returned back into the system. See, in a Stirling cycle, whether it's a pulse tube or a mechanical displacer type, the leftover pressure energy that wasn't extracted as cooling power is recycled back into the system at the end of the cycle. This is done by either adding energy to the flywheel or to the piston spring depending on whether you've got a rotary or linear motor. This energy is then used in the next cycle to help with the compression. In a GM cycle, the high pressure gas is simply discharged into the low pressure side of the system. But since there's no phase change occurring in this process, like with a normal vapor compression refrigeration cycle, this method of cooling is very inefficient. Suppose you've got a tank at some high pressure P1 and a low pressure source, be it the atmosphere or the low pressure side of a refrigerant loop at P0. When the tank is discharged to the low pressure side, the gas will exhaust through the valve according to this formula, where M is the Mach number, and this thing that looks like a Y is a gamma, which is the specific heat ratio. In the case of air, that number is 1.4, but in the case of helium, it would be 1.66. Now I should point out that flow through the valve orifice won't exceed Mach 1, and at this point the flow is choked. So here's what Mach number would look like as a function of pressure ratio. Speed of sound is given by this equation here, so we can change this graph to meters per second versus pressure ratio. Here we can see that we hit Mach 1 at a pressure ratio of around 1.9 for air, which is a little over 13 psi of gauge pressure, or 28 psi absolute. In a real cryocooler, the gas would be helium, so these numbers would be somewhat different. For now though, I'll be testing with ordinary air. So accelerating this gas means that work has to be done on it, and that work is done by all the gas in the tank right behind the gas that's leaving the valve. The gas in the tank gives up some of its energy to the gas leaving the tank and starts to cool off as a result. Now here's where we run into the efficiency problem. If you think about this for a minute, you can probably see that there's a major source of waste here. Gas inside the cylinder gets cooled, but then that cooled gas gets blown out. The higher the pressure ratio is, the higher the percentage of cold gas that gets blown out during a discharge, which is cooling power we could have otherwise used. Let's try to put this problem in perspective. Here's a graph of cooling efficiency for an adiabatic process relative to isothermal compression work. This would be a scenario like in a Stirling cooler where mechanical work is being done. You can see that we peak at a little over 40% efficiency. Now here's the cooling efficiency of a tank discharge versus isothermal compression work. It's pretty abysmal by comparison, peaking at just over 15% between pressure ratios around 2 to 3. It's no coincidence then that in commercial cryocooler systems that use the GM cycle, you'll see pressure ratios in this range. Typically the high pressure helium will be around 3 or 400 psi and the low pressure will be 1 or 200. This is in contrast to the Joule-Thompson cryogenic cycle, which is a completely different process where a pressure ratio of 200 or 300 is used to exploit non-ideal gas properties to create a huge temperature drop with a continuous flow through a flow restriction. But I digress. This is why on charts of cryocooler efficiency, we typically see that Stirling cycle coolers fall anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of Carnot efficiency, whereas GM types seem to hover around 5 to 10 percent or possibly even less than that. So why use a system that's so much less efficient? Well, the simple reason is that they're typically cheaper and easier to build. GM type cryocoolers are always ground based, used in a lab or a production floor, so size, weight, and efficiency constraints are much looser, meaning design and construction costs are lower. In contrast, Stirling cryocoolers are typically small self-contained units on board spacecraft, missiles, or portable systems where minimizing size and weight is absolutely crucial and you need to get the maximum effectiveness for a small package. Also, for coolers on spacecraft, maintenance is impossible, which imposes additional design constraints, which drives up the cost. And the maintenance thing is no joke. If helium leaks out of the cryocooler on a satellite, you're screwed. If you lose helium on a GM system in a lab, you just top off the lines. A GM system also offers increased flexibility in its setup. 
Theoretically, you could use any model of compressor that meets or exceeds the requirements of the cold head, put it in a corner of a room somewhere, and then run some hoses across the room to wherever it's convenient to install the cold head. You don't have to worry about matching the acoustic impedance of the compressor to the rest of the system like on a Stirling pulse tube. In fact, you could theoretically just run one off a big tank of compressed gas. You wouldn't even need a compressor continuously running if you had a big enough reservoir. Not that it's necessarily practical, but my point is that you've just got a lot more options with the GM system. Alright, enough theory, let's get to building. I started off with the heat exchangers. Instead of using the tube array from previous videos, I used a single half inch diameter 6 inch long copper pipe packed tight with copper mesh, soldered to 3 quarter inch NPT brass plugs with holes bored in them to fit the copper pipes. There will be two of these heat exchangers, one for the after cooler on the input and the other at the far end of the pulse tube just before the needle valve. Out of curiosity, I weighed the heat exchangers before and after the copper mesh was added because I was curious to know about the porosity of the mesh. The heat exchanger pipe has an internal volume of about 25 cc. The copper mesh adds 34 grams and the density of copper is 8.96 grams per cc, meaning the mesh only occupies about 15% of the internal volume despite my best attempts to pack it in tight. In the future, maybe I'll try a finer mesh. Next I connect the PVC segments. This cooler assembly will be much larger than the previous videos with 1 inch diameter 18 inch long PVC pipes for both the regenerator and pulse tube sections. Let's measure the density of the regenerator. The tube has an internal volume of 245 cc and the steel wool adds 115 grams and steel has a density of about 7.8 grams per cc. That brings us to a measly 6% density even after I pounded the mesh in with a hammer. Once again, probably going to need a finer mesh in the future. Next, I glue up a few more fittings and then add this 3D printed grate to keep the regenerator mesh from being blasted through the tube when the high pressure air is let in. Once that's in place, I slide the thermocouple through a hole at the edge of the grate and add copious amounts of glue to ensure that there's no leakage through the hole when everything is pressurized. After that, we have the valve assembly. These have a little bit of corrosion on the outside from sitting in the garage for years, but on the inside they're perfectly shiny and clean. One solenoid connects to the air compressor and the other is open to the atmosphere. The junction between them will connect to the aftercooler of the pulse tube. Our buffer tank, or compliance volume as it's sometimes called, is a 10 gallon or 38 liter air tank that will be connected by some quarter inch copper tubing with flare fittings. This is total overkill, but the next smallest thing I had was a 2 liter air tank, which was too small for the larger pulse tube. I got everything hooked up and somehow forgot to record it, so let's take a look at the piece of the project that makes the whole thing run, the valve controller. It's simply an Arduino board that controls two MOSFETs, one for the inlet valve and one for the outlet valve. There are four dials to control timing, one for the inlet open time, outlet open time, inlet to outlet gap time, and cycle gap time. These range from 100 to 2000 milliseconds in 100 millisecond increments. A switch allows selection between manual and automatic mode. In automatic mode, the valves will open and close continuously based on the timing that was dialed in, and in manual mode, the valves can be activated by push buttons. A 16x2 character LCD displays all the relevant information on a screen, which makes the whole thing very convenient. Here's the front panel showing the potentiometers, buttons, and LCD screen with its I2C adapter board. And here's the inside of the box, which is just an Arduino board and a 5 volt regulator. There's also a shield that goes on top of the Arduino with the MOSFETs and leads that connect to the valves, but for some reason, once again, I forgot to record that part. Anyway, let's hook it up to the solenoids and see if it works. Okay, looking good. For the high pressure source, I've got an air compressor that's about 1 kilowatt. I set up this big radiator with a fan blowing over it as an after cooler, and at the bottom of the radiator I have a coalescing filter to catch the condensed moisture and a desiccant dryer to trap any remaining water vapor that managed to sneak by. This whole arrangement brings the dew point down to around minus 40 C, ensuring that the air is bone dry, which is important for avoiding corrosion or ice buildup when the air is being used in the cooler. Let's set the output regulator, dial in the valve timing, and fire this thing up. Within a few seconds, we've dropped below freezing. Seems pretty promising so far. 
After spending an afternoon tinkering around with the valve timing and pressure settings, I managed to get a drop of about 100C below ambient. I started off by fixing my inlet valve time and adjusting my outlet valve time, then graphing the results. The following runs are all at 100 psi. Starting off at 100 milliseconds of inlet time, performance is pretty weak, peaking at about 24 degrees of drop. Performance seemed to improve as I increased inlet valve duration. The missing data here is because my compressor couldn't keep up past these points. All these points were tests with my needle valve closed, meaning all the cooling was coming purely from surface heat pumping, which is another mode that the pulse tube cooler can work in, but it's much less efficient. Let's open the needle valve slightly and see what happens. As you can see, there's quite a dramatic difference in performance. However, at 500 milliseconds on my outlet time, the compressor hit 100% duty, so let's bump down the pressure a bit and see what happens. These next two runs occurred at 50 psi. Half the pressure, but almost two thirds of the temperature drop, suggesting that running at lower pressure is much more efficient, which agrees with the efficiency graph I showed earlier. Now let's see what the double inlet valve can do for us. In the previous video, I showed that using a valve like this to bypass a portion of the flow improved performance by a small but consistent amount. But from research papers I've read on the subject, supposedly it's much more effective for lower frequencies. So let's find out. You can clearly see that opening the double inlet valve increased our temperature drop by 10 or 11 degrees. This can also be seen on this graph showing two identical tests with the only difference being whether the valve was open or closed. So we've clearly seen a benefit from the needle valve to the buffer tank and the double inlet valve being open, but what if we increase the inertance? I wound this coil from 25 feet of 3 8 inch diameter aluminum tubing which will replace the 3 feet of 1 quarter inch diameter copper tube currently connecting the buffer tank and here's how it looks. I swear to god it is a functional device and not just something I copied from a Dr. Seuss book. Unfortunately the additional inertance tubing seemed to cause a slight reduction in the performance. I suspect there may have been enough additional friction that it offset the incremental benefit from higher inertance. Oh well, it was worth trying. I should point out that all the temperature drop figures in the graphs I've shown were points recorded after 5 minutes of runtime. However, given a long enough time, these drops were much larger. Here's two examples of 1 hour runs. Both are at 75 psi with a 1500 millisecond inlet time. The blue line is a 1500 millisecond outlet time and the red line is 1200. After an hour, the temperature drop is almost double what it was at the 5 minute mark. However, it did seem to pretty much level off at 50 or 60 minutes. One major nuisance preventing me from doing longer runs was the need to constantly blow down my moisture trap since I didn't have an auto drain, and even when I did that, the desiccant dryer would still become pretty close to saturated after about an hour, and I'd have to swap it out with dry desiccant. This is a problem that would be eliminated in a closed loop system with a hermetic compressor. I did another set of experiments focusing on energy efficiency of different configurations. Using a power meter, I determined the average power of the compressor when it kicked on to recharge the tank, and then recorded its duty cycle at different pressures and valve speeds to figure out the average power consumption. First, I did a bunch of runs at a fixed pressure of 40 psi, but different cycle speeds. Looks like the best temperature drop occurred with both the inlet and outlet valve set to 900 milliseconds, which was also the largest temperature drop per unit power consumption. Next, I used that optimal valve timing and ran it from 10 to 100 psi and recorded the power and temperature drop. This showed that the temperature drop per unit power increased at lower pressure ratios, which again was consistent with the tank discharge efficiency graph I showed earlier. This tells me that to get the largest temperature drop possible, I need a small pressure ratio with a very large baseline pressure. However, that will require a closed loop system with a hermetic compressor, which will be a build for another video. Anyway, even with all this detailed information, I couldn't seem to push the temperature drop past about 100, which corresponded to about minus 75C. At one point I momentarily dropped 108C on a 25C day, which meant I hit minus 83C, but the result wasn't repeatable, so I didn't consider it valid. I wanted to try my idea I speculated about in my previous video about whether or not I could maintain the same temperature drop with a lower ambient temperature, so I printed several cooling jackets and connected them to the warm parts of the pulse tube to see if I could get the whole thing down to 0C with some ice water. If I maintained the 100C temperature drop, that would put me at minus 100C instead of minus 75C. 
With everything rigged up, the whole thing was pretty messy looking, but such is the nature of experiments and prototypes. Unfortunately, even with aggressive cooling using a ton of ice water, there was no real improvement in the maximum performance. Something else is causing a bottleneck on a maximum temperature drop. Aside from the fact that air is a terrible working fluid due to the low thermal conductivity, I suspect the regenerator probably isn't very effective considering how low the density was from the calculation earlier. Another idea I had was to try using a smaller pulse tube connected to the same valves and compressor. The current pulse tube had an internal volume of about 600cc, while the smaller one was only around 120cc. Maybe having a smaller space to fill would reduce the demand on the compressor so I could run higher pressures at higher frequencies to get larger temperature drops. Once again though, the performance was actually worsened, and both the maximum temperature drop and efficiency were reduced quite a bit compared to the previous design. I guess this shouldn't come as too much of a surprise since friction effects in pipes go up exponentially with smaller diameters. But hey, at least I managed to freeze some moisture out of the air and make ice crystals on it. I also managed to make this little chunk of ice, which was kinda neat. Anyway, that was a fun project, but I wasn't very thrilled with the performance. In the next part of the series, I'll use a hermetic compressor meant for refrigerators to compress hydrogen or helium as a working gas in a closed loop with a large baseline pressure and a small pressure ratio in the pulse tube to try and achieve maximum efficiency. Of course, this will require a device to produce hydrogen, and I'm also interested in the idea of pre-cooling with dry ice, so those are two separate videos I'm probably going to do before making part 5 of this series. Anyway, thanks for watching, and if you found this interesting, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next parts of this series.